We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I also would like to thank the Carta leadership for uh, inviting me to this symposium, and I thank everybody um, that is uh, watching for um, coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about wine retrotransposants. But before I get started, I really want to you to know the take-home message that I want you to uh, know for today. Um, first one is that the neighboring cells in your body are not identical. The second one is that humans restrict how different those neighboring cells can be a little bit more than uh, apes or uh, non-human apes. So with those uh, in the back of our minds, now let's start uh, um, with the exciting news. Uh, the exciting news is that we, what we learned in school about our own DNA is not completely accurate. The concept that all the cells in our bodies have the exact same distinct DNA, and that of course makes us very unique, um, meaning that me and my best friend, um, we're different, but all the cells in my body have the same DNA and all the cells in the body of my best friend have their own DNA, that concept has been challenged um, due to uh, a new DNA sequencing technology and uh, models both in vitro and in vivo that can uh, test this uh, uh, concept. Um, the idea now is that we are mosaics. And that means the cells in our body are not genetically identical. That's especially true for, for a brain. And, but the good news is that you are still unique in your own mosaicism. So um, one, of the, one of the culprits for those differences in our, that mosaicism in our genome is our retrotransposons. The retrotransposons are a class of mobile elements or jumping genes that are able to copy themselves uh, and they're all pre present in our genome and they uh, can insert elsewhere in the genome. Those uh, elements were initially uh, discovered, the transposome elements were discovered by Barbara McClintock. Uh, she got a Nobel Prize for that discovery and she uh, was not able to explain the inheritance of those kernels in maize that were different. She could not, uh, had different colors, she could not explain by using typical Mendelian laws. So she went uh, deeper into the genetics of what was going on and she identified uh, mobile elements, those DNA elements that were moving around and were uh, causing that diversity on top of what would have been expected by typical Mendelian laws. Um, the, specifically the ones that we are, I am going to talk to you about today, those are called line one. And line one stands for long interspersed nuclear elements. And they are the only autonomous 
uh, mobile elements that are active in humans. Um, to have an idea of how many are there, they comprise about 20% of our genome. In comparison to coding sequences, that are the sequences that make genes, those are about 2%. So they are very abundant uh, in mammalian genomes and specifically human and non-human primates. So what, are, what would be the consequences of these elements moving around our genomes? Um, uh, imagine that you have a sequence in your DNA um, being copied and inserted elsewhere. So that new insertion can affect chromosome integrity, cause diversity, and can also generate changes in behavior and potentially uh, diseases. So the genetic, the germline insertions um, can cause those structural variants, deletions, sequence insertions uh, within a human population. So they happen um, early uh, during development, either in the egg or in the sperm, and they can be passed along to generations and impact the population. Um, in those can potentially cause diseases, and the first evidence of uh, disease caused by uh, L1 insertion, line 1 insertion, was hemophilia A, resulting from a new insertion of a line uh, sequence. This was described um, decades ago by Kazazian. To date, over 120 human diseases are associated with line 1 events. So for a long time, uh, it was thought that um, all the the mobility, the line one mobility was happening at the germline um, uh, time of development. Uh, nowadays, we uh, know that line one incision can also take place uh, during embryonic development and even in adulthood. Um, so during development, given the copy and paste nature of the retrotransposome processes, line one driven insertions can accumulate. So as I mentioned before, they uh, can happen at the germline levels, which can have populational consequences. <clears throat> but they can also happen what we call somatic, which means um, not at the germline, uh, but later on during development. They can also happen at the embryonic development, um, and uh, they can also happen at the adulthood in organs, and I'm giving you an example of the brain here. Um, so how do we study line mobility during development? So especially human development. So first, you choose a cell line that represents human development. And um, luckily for us, uh, research from uh, Shina Yamanaka in um, 2008 uh, made it possible for um, researchers to study pluripotent stem cells, which were, uh, which are similar to the earlier uh, developmental stages um, where those cells are now possible to become different uh, um, any other cell in the body. So those pluripotent stem cells are able to become neuroprogenitors and neurons, for instance, but also other cells in the body. So we can use these uh, lines uh, in uh, the research laboratorial setting to study um, human development aspects. And we can look at, uh, indicated here by those red arrows, by you can look at line retrotransposition in these different steps, stages. Another uh, um, way is, or an additional way to, to study line mobility is to choose a system that will allow for monitoring line mobility in real time. Um, so we took advantage of a genetically engineered line one element, and that element can um, um, allow us to see a live mobility happening. How do we do that? Uh, it's uh, uh, an engineered element by John Moran, um, that can will show GFP or green uh, enhanced green fluorescent protein uh, glow after one round of retrotransposition. So what that looks like is um, we see those green cells in uh, the the dish of tissue culture, and when we have a green cell, we know that that was able we were able to see um, new insertion. So with that in mind, um, uh, we. This is work from uh, 
many years ago, we set up to, to look at uh, earlier stages of uh, neuronal development. So those are the baby neurons, so the neurons that the, the the progenitor cells that are going to become neurons uh, if we um, coax them with um, uh, specific factors. And we uh, uh, used uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, so those cells uh, that we could uh, make from uh, patients' uh, skin, and we uh, used cells from Rett syndrome, patients with Rett syndrome, which is under the umbrella of the autism, has some characteristics from autism spectrum disorders. So we took those neuroprogenitor cells highlighted here on the top, and we... Um, added the uh, line one indicator cassette to be able to see line one activity in real time. And uh, we not only detected line one activity on uh, neuroprogenitor cells here called NPCs from <clears throat> um, healthy individuals, so those are the call here wild type, uh, WT, but also we were able to see an increased activity, an increased real time jumping mobility of line one elements on red syndrome patients. Uh, so that highlighted to us that line mobility was happening in human diseases at earlier, potentially earlier time during development of the brain. Uh, we went ahead and uh, looked at potential causes for that increased mobility in uh, those the cells from derived from these patients, and uh, we know that the gene that represses one of the genes that repressive line re represses line one expression um, called MECP2. It's a methyl CPG binding protein. It's not functional in red syndrome patients. So uh, just to to give you uh, an idea of how how this gene works, it uh, um, occupies uh, uh, a portion of line one element in the genome that is responsible for the control of that element. And when you don't have MCB2 here, that's in yellow, uh, uh, shown in yellow, um, you will not have line one or you, have a, uh, 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 you don't have line one repression. So line one goes up. So motility, uh, mobility of line one can be regulated in neuronal progenitor cells and could play a role on complex neurological conditions. Since then, uh, um, other uh, researchers showed involvement of line one uh, activity in uh, other neurological condition, conditions such as um, uh, schizophrenia, for instance. Now, we want to shift gears a little bit and uh, uh, look at evidence for line one mobility in evolution, and we wanted to see if we could use the current models that we had in the lab uh, to study that. So we went even further back into the developmental process, and we used those pluripotent stem cells uh, to look at uh, line one mobility in real time. So we, we took a, a human, bonobos and chimpanzees, so those are our closest living relatives, uh, uh, and cultured those induced pluripotent stem cells from all of those uh, uh, of these uh, spe different species. And we looked for evidence of uh, line one vector transposition in uh, these stem cells from the different species. And what we noticed, we used the same uh, indicator that we had used before. So we're looking for green cells, the GFP positive cells. Um, and what we noticed is, yes, we do see uh, mobility in human cells, but we do see a significant increase in the number of uh, line one positive cells uh, in bonobos and chimpanzees, quantified here in the right. So we, we detected increased mobility in chimpanzees and bonobos, and uh, associated with that increase uh, was also a decrease, so here showed in green, of those two um, genes that are known repressors for line one. So they were in, shown in red, were upregulated in humans, so there was more of the repressor uh, proteins in humans compared to chimpanzees and bonobos. So that means um, uh, that line one was repressed in humans uh, in part by the increased presence of those two proteins, also shown here by those very dark uh, uh, um, 
uh, bands compared to chimpanzees and bonobo lions we had lighter bands so less presence of the repressors so since they didn't have the repressors present the chances of the lion one to be higher and and jumping more was uh, higher too so Line one was repressed in humans, but not chimpanzees and bonobos during embryonic development. So we asked the question, does increased line one mobility in non-human primates, when chimpanzees and bonobos, as we've seen previously in the cells, does it result in more line one insertions, more lines in the chimpanzee genome compared to the human genome? And um, to answer that question, uh, we collaborated with Chris Banner at UCSD and also Inigo and Alfaisa and Ahmed Tenli were, that were both at, uh, um, in the lab at the time. And we, we compared line, the presence of abundance of the elements in the genomes for various subfamilies, uh, different subfamilies of line one. So the way we looked at that is um, we compared the older line one elements. Uh, so we looked at both genomes, human and chimpanzees, and we searched for older line one elements first, the ones that uh, were present before the split between the species. So those are the L1PA4, line one PA3, and PA2. And when we look at the, the older elements, we didn't see a significant difference. Now, when it looked at the newer line one elements, which are present in the genomes of all human or chimpanzees, because they are after the split, uh, we did uh, see a significant difference where line one from uh, primates, non-human primates, more increased. So there were more abundance of the sequence from uh, uh, greater representation of recent line one content in chimpanzee genome compared to human genome. So we hypothesized that increased line one insertions in chimpanzee genomes could potentially contribute to increased genetic variability in chimpanzee populations. When we looked for evidence for increased variability in chimpanzees compared to humans, we uh, found um, some uh, data for that in literature. Work from um, a laboratory of uh, uh, Evan Eichler um, looked at great ape genetic diversity and population history, whole genomes of 78 great apes. And what uh, um, we're showing here is genetic diversity. What they're, they're sh we're showing, I'm showing this image is genet the genetic diversity measured by expected heterozygosity. Um, what it does, it, it will describe the expected, describe the expected proportion of heterozygous genotypes under uh, hardy weinberg equilibrium. Genetic diversity is the probability that a pair of randomly selected alleles from a population is different. Let me. Um, say that in different words. So um, what this uh, measurement does, the expected heterozygosity, it compares genes, set of genes that you get from mom, and set of genes that you get from dad, and asks the question, are they the same or are they different? And how and what is the um, proportion of the different uh, uh, that you have different mom from dad in your population. So, and that's called heterozygosity when you have different sets of genes from mom versus dad. So if your population has a high heterozygosity, that means it's, there is more diversity in the population. So in red, I'm highlighting uh, uh, the expected heterozygosity in humans and uh, expected heterozygosity for uh, many of uh, non-human primates. So um, from that study, you can conclude that non-human primate species have uh, increased heterozygosity, which is uh, uh, one way to measure genetic diversity compared to humans. So that's one of the examples. So um, we think that this increased diversity in non-human primate species could have been driven in part by the increased line one activity. So the summary uh, and implications of our studies is that line one elements are more active in non-human primates than in humans themselves. Uh, we also shown that species-specific line one elements are more abundant in non-human primate genomes than in human genomes, especially the newer uh, elements. Uh, 
And we also have some evidence in the literature showing that genomic diversity in non-human primates is increased. And we think that that could be potentially driven uh, in part by LN1 activity. So what are the implications of our uh, findings? Um, so longer brain development and cortical expansion in humans involves many successive cell divisions. If you have uncontrolled line one mobility, that can be a dangerous liability to proper brain development. Now, we speculate that a more stringent line one suppression uh, during early development might have been required in the lineage that, uh, uh, that is leading to, to modern humans. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for coming uh, and thank uh, um, Rusty Gage, Inigo Narfaiza, Armand Deli, and Chris Benner that were uh, directly involved in, in this uh, work. I would also like to thank a, a very uh, a bright and uh, uh, amazing group of uh, women that has uh, helped me a lot over the years for this project and uh, associated projects. And uh, I also would like to thank my uh, new CSD students that are going to uh, be taking some of the non-human primate work on, Isabel, Autumn, and John. Uh, I would also uh, like to thank CARTA and the Comparative Anthropology Series for inspiring uh, this work. And thank you all so much.